Hello and welcome to the Nash Tackle Off The Hook podcast. Just to make you aware, this podcast may contain some explicit slash offensive language. And if that's not your thing, you don't have to listen. But I have given you a warning. I hope you enjoy the rest of the show. You don't know the half of it, but yeah, um, I'm anyway. Yeah, I'm, open, I'm, on, I'm skating on the thinnest <laughs> ice known to man. Like. He said, and um, they put a poison in the tank that just instantly kills them. He went, and we've run out of it, so we cut their heads off with shovels. Suddenly, bang! The whole boat exploded. Take your sort of eight-inch long piranha and imagine that at four, five, maybe six feet. I said, I've revived your dead fish. <laughs> F off, he said. You haven't. That was just humongous. It was... I couldn't believe what I was looking at. I'm just battling this fish out and I'm, I know it's a black moon. I'm, yeah. like, I'm saying I'll never be a naughty boy again. If you catch fish and you return them to the water, then you are my brother. Hello and welcome to the Nash Tackle Off The Hook podcast. This week's guest, his second appearance, the one and only proper carp hunter that is Jim Shelley. Jim, welcome to the podcast, mate. How are you? Hi, Hassan. Thank you for having me back again. Can you please explain why we're running so late? Right, we're running late, <clears throat> and I will apologise now anything could happen in this podcast, because I've lost my head and I've made Jim wait, so he's lost his head as well. I have been stuck in standstill traffic on the M6 because it was shut due to an accident. So poor driver, whoever, whatever's happened, I hope they're all well. But genuinely, I couldn't get her in any quicker, mate. Okay, but I thought... Nash, you would have sent you a helicopter, mate, and picked you up. Because <laughs> you, you are so high profile. <laughs> Just my hair, mate, for protection. I thought I'd be insured, but okay. they haven't. I've managed to get here, and you have waited. So you have got a bonus four-hour session on the church, though. Four think. hours. <laughs> Cheers, yeah. Thank you. So I'm going to be casting out in the dark now, aren't I? And I've got to be gone by... Jane said I've got to be gone by here by 11, because I'm going to a two Michelin star restaurant... The Midsummer House in Cambridge. You love tomorrow. it. Tomorrow. You? you love it. A good yeah. old you like good food though, don't you? Yeah, I do, yeah. That'd be a good one. That'd be worth it. Well, I appreciate you staying. I genuinely do, mate, because I know it's been a bit of a, a nightmare every day and I've messed you about. And this podcast <laughs> might not have happened if you wouldn't have stayed. So thank you. Look, anything for you, mate. Oh so you owe me voice. now, don't you? I do. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's good. It's near Christmas and I owe Jim Shelley. Brilliant. Yeah. This is gonna end well. Um today's podcast. We're not going to talk about captures, although we'll get you in to talk about more because we've only scratched the surface on those in the last podcast. But we're going to delve into the mind of you when it comes to rigs. Now, you're pretty, I'm going to say, infamous in terms of chod fishing, but there's some other rig developments in recent times Mm -hmm. that have led to amazing captures, which you've had all the time, but you catching specific big rare fish that rarely grace the bank. And we're going to talk about just your thoughts around rigs, why you've refined down components and types of rigs that you currently use. I wanted to start with overall rigs for you. How how much importance do you place on them? <clears throat> well, as you know, I, I do a lot of tuitions and I find people are quite lost by... Um, They're watching, looking at too much. You know, someone like myself, I fish a lot. It's my living, um, an obsession, whatever you want to call it, but it is is my job. So if I've got all this time, why am I on a Ronnie rig? Mm. You know, um, why do I just stick to certain rigs? Because, look, if the rig is working, why break it? So, for instance, I need a decent bottom bait rig. Yeah, things can change, which they have from the normal dark side rig. And it's not my rig. It's a liner liner setup, but it got nicknamed the dark side because I was chod fishing for so long. And I think it was nearly seven years before I cast a bottom bait out. (laughs) So that's been developed and it's turned into a bungee rig, which is something we'll talk about after the chod side. So I've got my bottom bait set up, which has been developed, and I've got my chod um, a chod, chod rig and basically that is you can cast it anywhere um, but for instance you're fishing in very weedy water um, let's just say in here we've got structure of weed 8 foot in 10 foot of water how are you going to fish in something that is so thick uh, alright yeah, you could cast a, a bag yeah. um, moulded paste around the lead and you know, things like that, uh, a zig, but you're really chucking and chancing. Or or you could do the plumber around and try and find something. 
you might find something you might not. But when, when you stick, when you actually work out how devastating a chud can be, you're you're chucking the cherry on top of a on top of the cake, really, isn't you? It's the safe one on top. It's always fishing. So even if it lands, you don't know um, what's on the bottom of the lake. Say, for instance, in the winter, like a part of a bush has fallen in. If it lays on it, it's fishing. It's mm. always fishing. And you've got, you know, as long as your line is 20 pounds, say 15, 20 pounds braid. If you like, I, I use braid a lot, so I'm using 30 to 40 pound braid. Your lead core, you know, 30 to 45 pounds. Decent swivels. Um, your hook links, tw- 25 to 30 pounds, like the two and a half inch. Using a big hook, a size six, four or two. Um, they're not going to come off. But if you chuck, for instance, something that would be sort of easily picked up like a zig, mm. you've got to try and get that in, haven't you? How are you going to get it in on, even if you've got 10 pound or 15 pound line all the way through, you've got something that's up in the water, leads down. But when you're chod fishing, it's actually sitting on it all. And there's no real lead there because you're only using a lead to make the cast for the distance needed. And you've got sort of big tackle on, let's call it. <laughs> so, look, <clears throat> I'm not going to lie because I've wrote it in the magazines. Um, I said, when the choddy come out, a carp needs a PhD to pick it up and you, I need a PhD to tie it up. I don't mind admitting how wrong I actually was. The biggest step forward, as far as I'm concerned, legal step forward, let's put it right, in fishing, um, is a chod rig. Because you can cast it, like I said, anywhere. And if you get it right, oh, it's just unbelievable. Not fixed on the line. You know, as long as it's safe, yes, it's got lead core, but potentially everything has got the potential to be dangerous so you make sure it's all safe um beads coming off or there's no on the splice there's no like little piece coming out where it's been blobbed things like that you've got to make everything as as much as you can as safe as possible so um i was at a lake in oxford and i remember terry was there Nigel was there, Nick was there, right? So it was, you can imagine, it was like um, a lot of well-known anglers put together. And I can remember walking up there and I said to Nigel, I went, is that any good, mate? I show him my chud rig. <laughs> Never used one, just tied it up from what I'd seen and all the rest of it. Mm. And he goes, yeah, that's, that's bang on, Jim. But a bit like what I like to do, this is another scenario like the hinge diff rig. I like to mess around with things. So it's running two foot. So why don't we increase the lead core to seven foot, but making sure it's safe, right? But have it running. So if it was seven foot, you've got the bottom bead down a foot. Yeah. Or a foot up from the bottom and then the top one down a foot. So it's running five foot on lead core. And then I thought, well, Everyone sort of, they do the the pop-up part, the chod, and it's just slightly curved. But why not make a curved hook, a bit like a withy pull, if you want to look at it, or withy pull properties, and then you've got a hook that is banned, rightly so, on 99.9% of waters, yeah. which is a long shank nailer. So with the... <clears throat> The chod link, let's call it what I use now, £25 from Nash. Um, when you're playing, it's not like a lump of metal. It just goes straight, so you're not going to have movement yeah. in the mouth and all of that stuff, which is what happens with them hooks. And uh, I got to the curve, and then you mess around with the length of it, and I've come to, it sort of ends up at that shape there sort of thing. So it's, it's it looks like it's going to bite you. And you, when you, um like... Let's call it 
stroke it up and down and put friction into it, it, it gets a spring, which we've done a few videos on uh, while, yeah. while we waited for you. So people can, <laughs> sorry, but <laughs> so people can see that. And over six months, I come to this point where I was really happy with it. And I remember um, at a show, I saw like Nick was on the same stand as me. And I said, I'm really happy with this, right? And he said, Jim, we looked at that and dismissed actually putting a massive curve in it. And you've taken it on to something else. So I'll put my own. It's not my rig in any way, shape or form. And I've always said this, but I've put my own stuff. Stance, is it stance I want to say? My, yeah, your own slant on it. That's it, slant on it. That's the word I want. And um, you, you've got, what is it? Frank Warwick made this silt rig, which yeah. is Terry, Nick and Nigel. They tweaked it to the Chod rig. And then me, Jim, um, done my part with it, making it longer running and totally different. And uh, over the years, I suppose, it was at least six or seven years I used it exclusively and... It was just like find them, cast it to them. Any bottom? So you just literally casting it, showing fish? I did, I, in the end, I didn't really give a, sh- I didn't give a sh- sorry, a shit what it landed on. Weed, leaves, gravel, sand, clay, clean bottom, whatever. Didn't matter. And what about baiting scenarios around it? Right. It, it's all... What you, what you really want them to do um, as much as possible in, instead of being stuck pinned to the bottom of the lake, l- like glued to it, sucking, which is a lot what happens with a lot of baiting scenarios of today. You want to move it around. So you use a throwing stick and you just, I call it graze baiting. Yep. Some here, some there like that. Um, it was really funny, like where you um, heard people like Nick, Nigel and Terry say, oh, they used it with great effect on singles. For, for like something like two years, I never caught a carp, even though I tried it on a single. Mm. But and then all of a sudden, I caught one on it, and then I caught more. But I, I can never work that one out. Um, and I don't. That sort of like um, fox me a bit. Why for two years that I wouldn't get anything. No matter what sort of hook bait match it match the hatch, I hate that word, um, fluoro, and and then all of a sudden I was just catching on singles doing it, but it was always over bait. But I, the baiting situation is what I'd like to do is always keep the centre rod over the most bait, yeah. And then so you, if you were gonna a general baiting strategy, it'd be like this: I found them in yep. their many forms. Let's just call it their topping or their fizzing, right? Um, I would cast three rigs straight over the top, right? One after each other and leave the lines to sink while I'm casting the next one out. So it's done within minutes. Three rods are dispatched really quickly. And then I don't even sink the line then. At the next point, I pick up a a throwing stick and then I bait to them. But I keep most bait in the middle and then I cast one away longer than the middle or shorter or I do the same on the the right-hand one. But it'd be less bait. But what I decided to start doing, um, where I started to catch more over a rod that was fished a single well away. And it, it worked, for instance, like, right, two very big carp, I can just pick, sh- no, do you know what? I can pick out three 50 pounders where I was fishing over quite a lot of bait Um Let's use the first one. Um, it'd be the turtle out of Wellington Country Park yeah. in February. Um, I braced it with a 46, and that was caught over nine kilos of crumb. But the, the main... There was three hook baits all, all, in, all in the mix, but the one that caught was away on a single. Yeah. Away but I, but bait, the 46 though. was caught over the most bait. And I mean a long way away, like maybe 30 yards. Yeah. But I had two sort of like one in it, one just off of it, you know, in the mix, but one well away. All on choddies. Choddies. Um, then there's another instance, um, a very hard carp to catch paddle out of the wall pack. 
uh, 50 pound common. Um, known doesn't come out of Lake Five. I caught it out of Lake Five. Known not to come from deep water. I caught it from deep water. Known not to come over a bed of bait. I did and I didn't. The, the same scenario again. It slipped up on a choddy just away from the baited area. How how far away? Maybe 10, 15 yards. Not as far as... Not as that 30-yarder. No, but there was no free offerings there, mate. So why do you think... Do you think that's just generally bigger fish being more cautious and not attacking sort of the main bulk of bait and hanging off? Or do you think that's just coincidental? I think, look, a lot of these fish... um, these hard ones, mm. um, a lot of the time hang away from the main pack. Um, I've seen it. They almost let them go in and make the mistake and clear it up afterwards. But you, but sometimes they, it doesn't seem to matter. Mm. Like um, the Black Mirror, right? This is a, like I said to you that there was three, the Black Mirror, that was caught on a choddy, but there was only, I think, 75 free offerings spread over a 50-yard area. So they all seemed like, I would say they were all fishing singles because there wouldn't be a lot there. No. And I'm talking about like that and behind it and closer. Yeah. But one thing for sure, um, while it was in the sack, um, in a net so it couldn't get away with the mat on top of it. Um, when I come back with the camera and that, um, it was actually passing Scopic squid. Was it? So it had actually moved around picking it all up. So it was, it was, it was on the bait. So scenario wise, we've talked about this idea of throwing stick boilies, spread baiting. We've looked at the coincidence of, or not coincidence of catching out of the main bulk, if you like, of feed on choddies. Mm. We talked a little bit, and we'll talk a bit more about the actual tying of it. For you, chod fishing, you talked briefly about discovering the chod. Where was the first time that you sort of discovered it for yourself, but actually used it? Do you remember the first fish you caught on it? It was a lake in Oxfordshire. Yeah. And it was a 30-pound carp. And it was, well, I got in a bit of a, trouble there i renamed the carp and they didn't like it it's only 31 pound it looked like a tadpole and i called it the tadpole so apologies you know but but that was your first fish and that started and you said that there was about a six or seven year period where you pretty much exclusively used yeah, it yeah it was like honestly i've got how could i um I love these little pauses of yours. You're just trying yeah. to get yourself in trouble. This is good. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want to cause you any trouble. That's the thing. Right. Um, it was like, it become really easy because all I had to do was find them. But, oh God, the finding could be mm. 17 hours and it could cover 150 miles, 10 lakes. Do you see what I'm trying to say? So yeah. the the time and the effort involved in that, you know, you, you just go nothing here. Put maybe you put a bit of bait out and move on. Nothing here. Do the same again. Nothing. Oh, there's something you might fish and then they disappear and then you move on again. You know, it, we go back to that hunting element, don't we? For you, once you've found them, that rig you've developed confidence in in terms of fun, but being on them and then being there is the most paramount important thing for you, isn't it? Yeah. The problem is now, these carp have got so flipping wise. Mm. Um, it's not necessarily the noise of the lead going in because you can cast a long way and pull it back or use a, a smaller lead. It's, I'm, I'm sure it's the line when we sink the line through. Like a braid, you can see it, fluorocarbon, you can see as it sinks through the water because the light reflect. Ref, I can't remember the word. I won't refra- ref, refracts. Yeah, refracts down it. But when it's on the bottom, <clears throat> disappeared. But on that movement of it going down, that's all. I'm, I'm adamant to that because it's. I mean, I've noticed this so much. I've had a conversation with a um, a good friend of mine, Steve Alcott, today driving over here, and um, 
I've been on carp a hell of a lot and I know they're eating my bait, but as soon as you put a rig in, they know the rig is there. Yeah. And they're gone. And I think today we've hunted and hounded these fish so much to the point is any any noise of any description or something wrong, these fish move on. And I'm not talking about easy carp and I'm, you know, I'm talking about pressured hard carp. Um, it's almost like you want to set up if you can, like your rods are out and go down the other end of the lake. Um, I'm not advocating this because then you're off your rods, but it's something I have done. And then almost put, put a five, six ounce lead on there. Yeah, and just them out. Scare them up the other end. So because you're almost it, ahead of where they're going to move to. Yeah. But this this year alone, I've found by hunting them um, on pressured tricky waters, it's been a lot harder. Mm. They just seem to know you're there all the time. I've watched them up trees and, they, they, you know, they're looking at you. As much as you're looking at them, they're looking at you. And it's... We have basically half, mostly blown it in my in my in my eyes, and um, from COVID as well. What you got to remember, we've got a lot more bank side disturbance. Yeah. So you got new people, no disrespect to them. Um, you know, you've got a lot of noise going on, i.e., leads going in, spoms. Everyone seems to like a spom these days, don't they? <laughs> you know, Christ, imagine eating your dinner and you've got all that noise going on. Yes, okay. It does work. But on a lot of these tricky waters, I've watched people on the wall pack this year catch at the start over spawning and then they won't come there. Mm. And then, you know, we're, we've even seen, you know, th this is quite frightening really, or yeah, it's frightening actually. When you watch bait float up, not just boilies, but tigers. So you'd think a tiger would yeah. be quite a, um, it'd be more ex sort of acceptable to them than a boilie, wouldn't it? Yeah. So you imagine how long a tiger sat there and then decided it's rotting. So that's, I would say it's got to be a month in the summer. And they, uh, trust me, they smell as bad as a boilie when you like smell one. And, you know, I, the spawning in that area, they just, they would stay there in the weed. And I was watching it, you know, I, I like to try and understand what is going on. And then these couple of people where it was going on, they ended up, you know, they caught three, four carp to start with. And then nothing like for two months, one fish in three months afterwards. Mm. You know, if you were sitting there eating your dinner, Hassan, yeah, right? you, you know what I'm going to say, don't you? Yeah, of course. You know, in the end, we well, you know if you go to a wild war, it doesn't seem to really matter. Sometimes, you know, it doesn't matter. You just chuck a lead out and you, get, you catch one even on hard water. But a lot yeah. of the time, you know, it, I look at the wall pack and it's just, it's so busy. Yeah. It's, you know, they must think what the hell is going on? Lake Seven in particular, it was just spawned the granite out. You got like 14 people spawning for England and they're doing it again in the morning. Even though they blanked. Yeah, it's a lot of disturbance and yeah. a lot of bait. So what I'm trying to say to people as well, it's like sometimes um, it's better to put nothing in and fish away from everyone else. Yeah. Instead of, I mean, I watched one particular bloke spawning at 20 yards, right, with pellet and um, 10 millers and tiger nuts, but you could put that out with a catapult. Make a totally different noise, a totally different spread. Yeah. And it wouldn't, I know, kill the area is what I called it. I mean, people just don't seem to really learn. What do you think that is? Do you think that's just people sort of following the, the sort of fashion and what they see nowadays, if you like? Well, this person is a person that, oh God, I've got to be really careful here. Um, let's just call him, he's, he's a known angler. Right. So you, you'd think he'd learn that sort of something's wrong. Because if you're doing the same old thing and... Not getting results. Yeah. And you just sit there, you're going through a camping mode of nothingness, isn't you? 
I've been in a few camping modes of nothingness, mate. Have you? <laughs> yeah, 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 mate. On that motorway coming in today, mate, I was there. Um, back to sort of the chod. Now, you said there you talked a little bit about the, the sort of noise of the lead going in and you talked a little, about, a little bit about overcasting the fish, drawing it back in and letting it settle. Yeah. The actual crooks of of concealment and, and, and all those finer points of your egg, how much attention do you pay to that? with regards to visibility. A lot of the waters you fish are, are gin clear. They've got beautiful dark carp, loads of weed. They are that type of environment. They're not easy fish, as we said mm. before. How much attention do you pay to to sort of trying to conceal your lead core, your lead? Obviously, the actual section of your chod that we're talking about is relatively invisible anyway. But how much do you pay t- to that? Or do you not? I did and I don't anymore. Okay. Talk to me about I don't that, really though. know that why. I mean... Years ago, I used to make um, like lead core leaders and then age them in a stinking like ditch somewhere for several months. So you go black, smelly, and, and then pull them out and use them. Put the swivels on and all the bits I need, but the lead core was aged. Now I'm not, do you know what? I'm, I'm just not really that bothered anymore. You don't think there's any difference in catch rate? No. Yeah, the... the the problem, like I've touched on already today, is it's nothing to do with the actual rig. Yeah. It's the descent of everything past the rig, the line. As soon as you drop that, they know, they can see it. You imagine that dropping through. Mm. So it's trying to get your rig in without ups. I, I suppose, look, I love four rods. I love it. You know, I just love putting four rods out. Try loads of different things. This year, I probably fished. I fished one rod more, two rods more. I probably caught more fish by using less because it's it's a it's a less less human noise factor. Um, it's like the let the lead size small as possible on a choddy. Cars past it, reel it back. You know, you've got to do everything you possibly can to cut everything down. Yeah. But you've just got to be mindful that at some point you've got to get a rig in. You're just playing Russian roulette all the time. That is... You've got to take That's carp yeah. fishing. Once one's in it and done that, uh, and all of that, because as far as I'm... I know they communicate, right? One's gone. He's mm. gone. He's moved off. The rest are moved off. It's like almost better. Some, I tell you what, right, I've started doing. I've started casting at night because I think that gin clear water, there's no light. They could feel it coming down. I'm adamant they can't see it coming down. Yeah. So that's worked. I've caught a period in the spring. I caught quite a few 30 pounders, just kept it quiet um, at the wall pack. And I'd find them. I'd bait them. I wouldn't put a line on them, but I wouldn't put loads of bait out there, but I wouldn't cast my rigs until it was dark. Um, I suppose by spending loads and loads of time and analysing. Yeah. Um, I'm tr- always trying to find something. No, I'm trying to find an edge on everything. And sometimes you just have to adapt to the situation um, to the point of I might bait up in an area and pretend I'm fishing there and I've done all this. <laughs> and then moving in the dark. Yeah. Do you see what I mean? But I've baited a prime area, but they might be there the next day. Um, and then people are going, oh, why are you going? And they might go in there and you just play the game. You know, that's, you're playing a game with the angler and the carp. Yeah. Yeah. Especially with the banks being a bit busier. That, yeah. That comes into play. Yeah. Chodrig, talk me through, and we talked about experimentation and that's a major thing. And you said the process of sort of getting to where you've got to now on the chod rig yeah. is, um, has taken a period of time, experimentation, catching fish for you. Now, if you were to set up a chod rig and we have got some footage, which I'll overlay when we talk about yeah. tying it, cause we've yeah. done that. We filmed you tying it. What from the lead end up, talk me through the basics of, of, the actual chod rig for you, the length of things, the materials used and the actual specifics of that rig. Right. 
I'm going to say this again. We need to make sure that look, everything is as safe as it possibly well can be, right? So if in doubt, buy a ready-made leader, all right? Um, there's loads of information on the internet anyway about splicing, but if in doubt, you've only got to buy three leaders, haven't you? Maybe buy six, you got a spare one, but we don't want to be losing lead core leaders. Anyway, keep the leader as short as possible. You only need to use it long if it's really weedy, as far as I'm concerned. So let's say we do a five, six foot lead core, for instance. We've got um, a clip, a uni clip on the end, and that's to attach the lead. And that needs to be as small as possible, right? Because it's only got to cast the rig out, okay? Um, most of the time, I don't fish past 80 yards, so I'm using ounce to two ounce, ounce and a half, two ounce. You then go up from there, so about 12 inches, you put a double, just like a granny knot, and then another granny knot. That's not got to be safe, because that's by the lead there, right? And then you put um, a bead, a large bead, and then I put a bit of silicon there, right, to um, rest the bead on. Yeah. Okay, then you put, um, I use a Nash micro ring swivel, put that on. Then we go up to the end, I put a bit of, uh, is it 0.5 silicon? Yeah. And then I put a small bead on the end, okay? Now, I stretch the silicon so the bead only just holds. So if I was going to cast at range with the force of that, it's going to knock the bead off. So what I would do is just put a bit of PVA there. Sure. Okay. Because I need it to be as safe as it possibly can. Okay? Yeah, in the event that cracks off or anything, that that will yeah. pull the swivel will pull off the top. Exactly. Yeah. Um, then we go back down to the swivel end, which is the Nash um, micro ring swivel. I use um, twenty five pounds most of the time. Twenty five pound um, Nash chod link. Um, I use a size six. Mostly a size five uh, chod claw. I then have quite a big D on that and I put a ring on it. And then I, I either, if I'm using a cork ball pop up, I tie them on. Yeah. If I use a, an air ball pop up, I just put it on the baiting needle, pull it through and blob it down. Simple as that. I have a curve, which is the shape of like a, a, a C hole, like that sort of, like that really. So it's biting. You rub it, which is all explained on um, how you rub it to create uh, friction to just to get the curve. But you put a spring in the hook link um, and that hook link is around about two and a half to two and three quarter inch. How did you get to that? Because um, I've seen people use choddies that are real oh. small. I've seen them. I've used them short. I've used them quite <laughs> quite big and i've sort of depending on where i've been or what i've been fishing for i've adjusted that i've never really come to sort of a set length genuinely for me for you how did you get to two and a half well it's inches? like look i was a four rod merchant so yeah. i would just mess around with things after a while like i always do um you you just go look i've got short leaders on i'll try longer leaders so yeah. we're running even more let's see what happens um more of a bend in it and then I, I like I said earlier, the six month period, I got to that shape and then running. I, I like it running like five foot on seven foot of lead core. Yeah. That's quite a bit of play, isn't it? Yeah. But you think about it, right? You don't fish a tight line. No. Um, because if it knocks against the bead and you've got a tight line, it could use that part to bounce the hook out. So you've got to have it slack. So if you can imagine, it's laying on the bottom, like, of course, like that. The fish comes in to pick it up horizontal like that. What you need it to do under a slack line with the lead core draped that way and that way, as it picks it up, it then gets hold of weight. And as it goes to that point there and he shakes his head, there's no point of reference to get off. Yeah, it's got no lead to it. So yeah, yeah. you normally get a did it did did Yeah, yeah. Yeah, either on braid or uh, fluorocarbon. Okay. And at that point, it either just you get a funny sort of take or you get a melter. Normally, I would say seven to eight times out of ten, it would just be like a bleeping sort of take. It doesn't know what's happened. Yeah. Um, 
all my rods are on chods. I'm going back to chod fishing at the moment. I shouldn't even, I said to myself, I wouldn't say that because all I'm doing is highlighting it, innit? <laughs> no, Everyone I'm not, I'm not, no, I'm back chod, on the hinges, sorry. for yeah. gods. Yeah, I'm, I'm on the hinges, sorry, yeah. <laughs> I might have to tell a little white lie for a change, Hassan. <laughs> Too honest, mate. But you're on the back on the chods, and you you got to that two and a half inch, guy and you talked about the running element between the two beads being about five foot, yeah, roughly yeah, on yeah. seven foot of lead core. Yeah. For you, you talked about the bikes. We took. I've infamously seen in loads, especially your early vlogs, mate, which I used to watch a load. Mm. I've you seen your rod setup as well in terms of your rod tips in the air. Yeah. Some people cloning you up. Um, but oh, that God, You're using all the prime I'm words now, aren't you? I'm cloning yeah. now. Yeah. I'm, I'm really proud of you. I've not said sheeping yet. Maybe that will come in there. Do you know what I mean? I've, 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 yeah. I've sort okay. of off that earlier okay. on. Um, your rod tips in the air, mate. Um, slack lines going down. Explain to me why the rod tips are in the air. Right. What the um, Why not the conventional sort of rod tips as you would normally see on nine, 90% of people's setups? I'm glad you brought that up. Um, because you're probably the first person that have, has asked me that question at the right time. So we've got the rig out in the ponds. We've got a mega slack line. So like I said to you, um, a lot of the bites, you know, you can have one notice from nothing, mm. but they're just like bleeping because they don't know what's going on. There's no lead. You know, it, the chod is six foot away if it's on seven foot of lead core from the lead, isn't it? Yeah, they've so got no lead. Sometimes in the shallow lake, they're on the top. You know, you just see swirling. So what happens is, like, what you want is that line, it's mega, mega slack, right? And then it's pulled tight, and then the rod then um, then bends, folds towards it, under tension with the clutch set in a clip, so it pops out the clip, and then the clutch just gives enough so you don't lose the rod. It's hooked itself. Because you imagine you're sitting... You might be up a tree watching. You might be in bed sleeping. You might be sitting on your chair or whatever. It's quite a few seconds to get to the rod, isn't it? Yeah. So by the rod compressing, it set the hook for you. That's why a lot of the time, no matter what I'm doing, I fish with my rod tips. I mean, I used to fish them up like that, but it's not quite so much like that now. But I do like my rod tips up. So as it pulls, it bends the rod in and you've, got the cl- you've just got to make sure that the clutch is set. Pucker. So it's so you enough it, tension. You don't yeah. want it so it's flying line out, but you don't want it so the rods. Sometimes if you get a fast take, the the, the butt can lift up, but it's just the, it's still giving line because it's so fast. But essentially the reason your rod tips are up is because that rod hooking. then comes into play to hook the hooking. fish. Yeah, hooking, yeah. And you haven't, especially in, in certain in, uh, instances, they haven't felt the, the weight of the lead at all. They're tightening the line. They might not hit the bead, but your rod's coming into play as well when they do. Yeah. And that's getting you good hook holds. In terms of hook holds, we talked about you tinkering things, experimenting, if you like. Are you looking at specific hook holds, middle of the bottom lip stuff? 100%. Yeah, about half a hook into a whole hook in because I've curved it to do that. But the other thing is what a lot of people don't realise is you need a super sharp hook. He loves a sharpened hook, this boy. You know boy, what I mean? He? You've got to have a super sharp hook. So it's like they pick it up and it's like, what, what's that? But there's no point of reference on the lead. They don't feel nothing. There's nothing. And then all, they, they're almost in like, what's going on? But there's something in my mouth, but I can't. But they're hooked. They're shaking their head. I, I'd love to see a carp, mm. right, hooked up on a choddy. I was just thinking that. It'd be, I think it'd be mental. Like they just rise off the bottom, like spacking out. But it's different, isn't it? Because normally when you think when most carp are being hooked, uh, blowing in, ejecting baits, they're coming into contact with that lead pretty quick, aren't they? Yes. And this is completely the opposite. And and we've known rigs that have done really well because they've played on the fact that they don't hit the lead or the lead moves and discharges or you have some sort of running element in it. But this has a running element, but it has no real, if you've got that much play, it's completely different. That's what I do with the bungee rig. Big lead's on. It's not big jump, leads off. Not jump forward here, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> We're not done on this. I'll job probably yet. get now to using big leads next, won't I? But no, there you right. go. Big leads are all right, mate. Yeah, yeah. Um, so we talked about the hook holds. They've got to be a prime, middle, bottom of the lip. Back. What adjustments would you make if you're not getting those hook holds? Because I'm guessing at Never. some point. Never. What do you mean? I wouldn't change nothing. So even if the hook holds were a little bit, you just crack on. Yeah. 
I don't often lose anything. Yeah. Sometimes, I remember Terry telling me, um, you know, talking about things and all the rest of it um, years ago about chod fishing, and he said sometimes you'll get a bite and it'll come off. Mm. It's a 50-50 chance if it stays on. Um, and that's where it, you know, we've all had a hook hold and it's been bird over, haven't we? Yeah. We've all had a fish on and it's come off mm. and you look at your hook and you think, how the hell is that bent over right like that? And I don't mean one that's been like fine right down or nothing. And if it hits, if it hits bone, that is in the lap of the gods really, isn't it? Yeah. You know, um, and I'll just never forget the words what Terry said to me. He said, some you win, some you lose. It's 50, 50. But what I decided to do, right, is, you know, we all do our own thing. So this isn't me saying it's right or if it's wrong. So I just moved everything away from the lead. So if you can imagine, um, a lot of standard chod setups, you know, what, what, wherever they put the bead here in the fight, it ends down by the lead, even if there's a little boom, right? It's here, isn't it? Whacking around yeah. the lead. But when you put that and it's 12 inches away, you shake that with the lead there and the lead doesn't come into play. You've got the lead. You imagine it's there. It's hitting their face as they're shaking. Because trust me, they're trying to get rid of it, right? Mm. As you're playing them, you can feel it sometimes. And then you've got the lead, you've got the lead, like I said, hitting them. And then you imagine that's working the hook out. So I remember on a water, I lost five on the bounce. But these fish fought like you don't want to know. Absolutely fought. Like, and I just thought, I can't, go. and I just put a knot in it and it stopped it. It just stopped it. No more losses. I might have lost one in the whole time I fished the water or two, but I were I didn't lose five on the bounce. No. But that was all part of early, le early learning yeah. chod fishing. So basically now you couple of granny knots and everything slides down to yeah. that granny everything, knot. Everything below the swivel, yeah. right, is fine. Everything above the swivel has got to be safe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As safe as possible. Minimum 15 pound line. You know, I don't want to leave lead core laying around or anything like that. Um, you know, if you said to me, Jim, do you use a naked child? No, I don't. I don't like it. I've lost too many carp doing it. I give up. Maybe I should have played with it more or whatever. Um, I had a bloke on intuition to, uh, yesterday, actually. He said, what would you do then? I said, right, rules are made to be broken. <laughs> So the rod in the area would be on lead core, but I'd always make sure the left hand rod was naked or on something else. Oh, right. Yeah. Yeah. I've done that at a water in Essex and it worked to great effect. Do you know what I mean? So for you now, you wouldn't, if it was no. Everyone's going to rig check me now, isn't they? Yeah, you're Jesus. gone, you're, This is not working you squeeze, out well you. you. squeeze the shit out of me all the time, Hassan. <laughs> you, um... You basically don't like naked chod fishing with regards nah. to you've lost fish on them and you're not confident in it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, I get that, mate. You're the chod father, yeah. mate, ain't you? Maybe if I... No, I just don't want... I'm a braid angler, so you can't put them on braid. Yeah. I only don't use braid, really, if I can't use it, because you can't hide it, can you? It's no. not like a Ricky. Once can't. it's in the pond, it doesn't matter, does it? But braid... You can, so if I can't use braid, then I use fluoro. But I wouldn't turn around and go, I'm going to this lake. I can't use braid, so I'm going to have to use fluoro. And then fish toddies, I'm not going to do that. No, no. Sorry. And for you, braid straight through to your lead core leader and then out? Yeah, no, I don't have... No fluoro leader in between? No, I, like that. that is definitely a no-no. You're, you're, it's like putting glass to paper in it. If you want, Because that? you're... The braid is far stronger yeah. than the mono. And you've got another knot in... End of the weak point, yeah. Yeah. No, 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 no. No, no. I have done. Yeah. Long, long, long in the chod learning phase, but not for many, many, many years. Like, since I've been within... I took it off. I didn't even like it. Yeah. The knot going through the rings, the curliness of it all, you'd have to pre-stretch it. You know, you pre-stretch it and then the knot might go. 
You know, then you've got weed snotters, I call them, yes. hanging. You know, I don't want all of that. Yeah. You know, if, if look, once you master fishing with braid, as long as you, no backwinding, backwinding is for pussies. And <laughs> I'm sorry, right? The only person that I'll give any respect to that backwinds is Terry Ann because he still puts a clutch. He's the only one. You watch some of these people, right, trying to backwind these superstars, right? And they can't even keep up with it. And they wonder why they lose carp on like Ronnie Riggs and all the rest of it. Sorry, got to say it. The art of carp fishing. Set a clutch. Jim, mate. <laughs> <laughs> a couple of minutes. Uh, I think my head's still on the motorway, but that's brought me back, mate. That's brilliant. Yeah, that you is. like that one. Oh, that is yeah. brilliant. Um, <laughs> hooks. Talk to me about Perhaps hooks. we've gone right the right hooks. Yeah, yeah go on. <laughs> so we talked about the um, the elements in there, the lead claw, the, the clips, the leads, all that sort of stuff. Yeah. We talked about the running element, your experimentation, hooks. Now, for you, when it comes to a chod hook, and you're catching some of the, the finest, rarest, hardest fighting fish that there is, and you're straight from braid, mm. what you go to? We talked about size, but what pattern? Right. I've used many hooks. Yeah. So I have to be careful what I'm going to say here because some are all right and I'm not going to mention like companies' names. It's because I just don't want to go down that route, really. Um, right. The best way to set like, like this I used to use pinpoint hooks before they were with Nash. Yeah, before Mark, yeah. Anyway, um, Mark sent me some samples of things and. Things have changed and he went his way. It was his company anyway and I went my way, right? So at the end of the day, I've always, Kev, you know, even though I left Nash Bait and Tackle a long time ago, Kev, me and Kev have always gotten all right and he's always said, whatever you want, Jim, you can have, right? So he's, it's like he sends me things like I'll just get like a little password and have a note in it or I'll get like a phone call. Oh, Kevin, hello, how are you? You know, what can I do for you? And um, it was, I've got something for you to try. So anyway, he sent me these claw hooks. Yeah. Now, this isn't, I'm not trying to push them or anything like that. I turned around and went, what the fuck is that? It's going to open up because you've got like, it's like a 50p in it. So you think it's going to have a break point. Yeah. You try and open one up. Right, so I started using them, and all my mates are taking the mick out of me, right? These are chod claws, mate, yeah. 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 All my mates are taking the mick out of me. They're me- Look, they're some of the sharpest hooks I found out of a packet, just out of a packet. So if I was fishing the lake, that was, you know, when I sharpened my hooks, it was really acidic. Um, They would be the ones I would use now. They're mega to sharpen, but you can only do it touch it once more but a hook is a hook what's a hook cost nothing um anyway i like the fives right because they're a like a bigger gape on them right and they've got a nice long point on them and when you know how to sharpen um a hook properly they're unbelievable i mean I, I, like i said i had this tuition yesterday i showed this bloke he just touched one of my hooks before we even, and he was, he just went, Jim, I've never touched a hook like that in my life. And he goes, what, what the hell is that hook? I said, well, it's a Nash chud claw. He says, I can't believe it. How sharp they are. Look at them. And then I tied it all up. And cause he wanted a, he wanted to know about, um, how to tie chods up. Anyway, the hooks, like I said, they're so sharp and they're so strong. Look, I've got other companies hooks, which I'd swear by one in particular. And I use the hooks now for sharpening on tuitions because I've bought so many packets. <laughs> I buy a lot of my tackle. Okay. I don't have Kevin. He supplies it for me, but I use a lot, a lot of Nash tackle now. Yeah. So I use it and they're saying, but that's not them. But I said, I've just paid four pounds something, five pound a packet. I'm going to use these. You know, you're going to mess up at least five of ten hooks out of that packet. Yeah, I don't want you messing up all the 
or, or, or Machod claws, you know. So I've started using them this year and I mean, I like the six, but the five is to me is far, 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 far better. Just by, like I said, the, the, the size of the gape, the length of the point. I mean, you know how to hone down that point and get it not needle shot, but it's, it's all of them boys in there. When I, I done a little video sharpening a hook and they couldn't believe how sharp I got them hooks. And as far as I'm concerned, you can always tweak. If Imagine if, look, you can always tweak something down the thing, but you imagine if, um, or, yeah. If I I could imagine if Kevin brought out a range of sharpened hooks, it'd be a game changer. Because like Mark Vusen yeah. at Pinpoint yeah. used to do all of that. So he, he has got the knowledge. Maybe I shouldn't be talking like this. I don't know what's in the pipeline, you know. But that hook is... Size five, mate, and on the bottom, it's it's not it's nasty. Yeah, just a claw on the bottom, which I use on the the bungee, which we'll yeah. talk about. Yeah, chod fishing with your chod rig. If you fished a water which had, let's say, let's say it's relatively low stock, but it had a smaller size of fish, so you've not got your thirty pounders. I don't know. You're up north on this is very generalised. Okay, but you know yeah, what I'm yeah, yeah, yeah I know north, what you mean. Yeah, and you've got I don't know. 20 pounders do you think it would be just as effective with a smaller stamp of fish or do you think it's it is the fact that it's a high pop-up the fact that you're fishing it in that style lends itself i don't think it is a high pop-up because it might be two and three queen two and three quarters long but when you bring it down curved it's probably only two and a bit maybe right well if you can trust that to a rig yeah but hold on a minute but you, you could still use a smaller hook in a smaller bait yeah I catch small carp on size fives. So you think it's it's not it's not as selective in terms of big fish? You don't think? You think you'd still yes catch? and no? I I think I'd still catch. Yeah, 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 yeah. You'd be happy to take that. But there. if you wanted to go down and use, you know, like you are targeting fish to twenty five pound in the lake, um, just downsize downsize the hook size, curve it. Of course, it's got to be curved. Mm. Um, and use a smaller hook bait. Um, it's hard to find a small hook bait that is buoyant enough, but you can easily drill it out and cork it up, can't you? Yeah, for you, hook bait, size, you said cork balls and you said air balls, but roughly size for you? 15, 16 mil. Yeah. All year round, summer, winter, spring? Yeah. Colours can change. We don't. I don't want to get into the point of talking about colours and liquids. Maybe another time, because yeah. I'm going through a little period of... I'm changing something at the moment. Um, don't give away at all, Jim. No. If you don't it's not, it's not about giving away. It's just my mind. Things have changed with carp fishing. Yeah. Um, in many aspects this year because of mostly pressure, which we've touched on the subject about. So uh, maybe in six months or so, I might have something to talk about. But as you well know, mate, my heart is overseas now. Yeah, you've gone, haven't you? Yeah, gone to the proper dark side. Proper dark side. So I fish for wrongings in the right country. Exciting though. Yeah. I think, um, isn't it? For you, you've got to be. Yeah. I can imagine, right, <laughs> sitting back over 18, 20 months, right, um, shitting myself, talking to this bloke. I'm not going to mention no names, just call him, he knows who he is. A uh, Belgian contact who I met on Instagram and he said, come over. And it's like... Driving abroad on the other side of the road, I can. Um, it was, it was a nightmare, mate. <laughs> and it was like he said, like, "Look, Jim, I'll come and meet you wherever you come, and you can just follow me." And it was like, it was like, I've never done it, but imagine, like, and then I thought, right, I'm going to do it. Right, I'm doing it. Something happened. Right, I was like. Ding me on a ticket. I don't want to go into who or whatever. Um, and the deal was I got him a ticket and he let me fish his water and he let me down. But that, right, that person 
will be watching this video and he has the same name as me, right? And he will now realise I owe him um, some thanks in a funny sort of way because he pushed me forward to actually, instead of talking about doing it, I actually done it. And um, I went out there and I have never felt so free. Mm. Like when I got to the other side of First Simons by Ferry, um, I've done the tunnel as well. I've, I've been over quite a few times, like, and I went in the shittiest time of the to start doing this. But, but, imagine if I'd have done that in spring, it would have been, um, yeah, I would have had all of that driving on the other side, which I don't care about filling up with fuel, going in a shop. How the hell am I worried about going in a shop when you just go and get your stuff and you just like hand over the blooming, I you know, you put the card at the machine. But I got quite apprehensive about it, but now I love it, mate. And it's just like the first time I got to um, this canal, so it's my first trip, I drove down. It was 7.2 miles long, right? It's dammed off. There wasn't a car panger on there, but on the stretch, I could look that way and go three quarters of a mile. No one there. I can't see that. A mile, mile and a quarter there. I can't see no one. And the first message I sent out, right, you might laugh about this. I can't hear a, can't hear a spom. I drove along. I walked some of the bank. I didn't see a spom hanging in a tree. It was just like freedom, complete freedom. Like what I have not experienced since poaching times, you know, yeah. a few years ago was the last time I had any amount of freedom, but you were still dodging people. And, uh, mate, I can't wait till March and that, just to be free. Even Jane's coming. Yeah, good. She's coming in May, in May and that. She's going to come. It's good. It's nice to see you like, well, you excited by angling anyway, mate. You always yeah. come to life. I've got disillusioned in this this country. It's good. I think it's good to broaden your horizons, mate. And Kevin turned around and goes, I can't believe how long it's... Fucking taking you. Mm. I mean, oh, cheers, Kev. Yeah. Mm. You, it's brilliant. Like, the, the I'm not going right there for big ones if I catch them. Yes, I'm just going there for old nice ones from there. But it's all about the freedom, the adventure, mm. right? The nature. Look, when you're in Belgium, the people are so lovely. They talk to you. I was watching people go past on a bike singing and it's just like it had a calming influence on me. A calming influence on Jim yeah, Shelley. Really, you know, and they're, they're, I'd love to live there. Oh, here we I re- go. I really would. Here we go. But We've lost him permanently to the dark side. Now nah, you'll be back here, mate. So, yeah, my main fishing is abroad. So, watch this space. Yeah. Watch out Europe, mate. <laughs> it's good. You'll <laughs> catch him, mate. I know you. Well, will. last week, right, believe this or not, I think I've done 900 miles looking at lakes and stuff like that. One minute I was in France. I was in. I've done the whole circumference of Belgium, and I ended up in Germany. <laughs> <laughs> you sent me some videos of some pretty impressive spots as well, mate. To be yeah, fair, yeah, the police chasing me on the uh, on a river outside a nuclear power station. <laughs> that was quite funny. <laughs> and then there was a, like, a police boat go. So like, it just keeps following me, doesn't it? Classic. We soon got out of there because we didn't have a ticket for that region, you know. So <laughs> classic, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> Wait for the European chapters, mate. It's going to be a good book. That um, back to hook sharpening because you you have, yeah, you've very much been on that from a from a from a long time, a long while ago. And I remember you talking about a specific. It was a jeweler's pillar file, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cut for yeah. That's the one. And yeah. I remember getting it off eBay when you were talking about it on the old thing, and it was it was mega. It's mate. the one. Yeah, it is the oh, one. Oh, you still look, use that now? Yeah. Oh yeah, of course. Um, I I use I use um, look. I used to import them from um, Switzerland through a contact, and then just you know, hello, Hassan. Do you want one of my files? Yeah, okay. Yeah, you sold me a right kip. That was good. Though. Anyway, right. You caught me a lot um, fish. That same contact I've give to uh, ACP Bates now, so they do their own hook. Um, Hook sharpening kit. So, in no way, shape, or form am I turning round and saying that I started off hook sharpening because no. I didn't. Right? I first saw 
someone doing that. Um, a lovely little person called, I named him Nanny Goat from um, Toll Pit States. That's the first time I saw it. I messed around with it. I didn't really take it anywhere. Um, something I missed. Maybe it was because it wasn't what I thought was the right tool for the job. Um, as you may know or not know, I'm into, um, I used to be a butcher slaughterman. <laughs> so I can sharpen my knives, right? And I mean proper knives, skinny knives, you know, different edges for different jobs, you know, different edge for like cutting round bone and all the rest of it. Um, so you would use an oil stone or you'd like polish it on marble, stuff like that. But I did not have the knowledge of the right file. My good friend, Steve Alcott, give me that knowledge. Right. But I, I'm not going to lie. I, um, I kept turning it down for like a good 18 months. Um, I do the, pick the sharpest one out the packet scenario, you know what I mean? And I thought, I must be missing a trick here. Normally, I give Steve, ed or no, I don't give him edges. I mean, he's like... Experiment. Yeah. Crash test done. Yeah. And then he takes it on, if you know what I mean. Yeah. So, it's a bit like the salt thing as well. How many... T t year 2001? I don't know. Anyway, um... I've then decided, right, I need to try this, right? It's, it's got in my head. It was like incessant, like, have you got that yet? Have you got, and it, like I said, it went on for a good 18, 20 months and I've got one. I've got <laughs> the file. Now, I know the angles I need to use. It was adopting um, my own style, finding what was good for me and what I consider to be, Give me the best sharpened hook. I'm not going to lie again. I've changed that. I used to do a lot of wrist action, right? Where I don't do that now. I'm quite, and it's easy for people, I think, to actually copy that. I think that's why we've done a short video on it as well. Um, and it's it's simple. And it's just, you've just got to be, it's all about the pressure of the file on the hook mm. and the angles, being it's not about being fast it's about being smooth and precise and like i find on a lot of tuitions people's attention to detail is you know um far far less than i'm going to use me as an example all right maybe i'm i'm ocd but everything has to be like it's a hundred percent from the line to the you know the right rod the the, the reels working okay the, the rig, the hook sharpened correctly, the descent of the lead, the way it goes through the air, et cetera, et cetera. But once the traps are there, at the end of the day, there's two main things that need to be managed and correct. Hook hooks them up and line brings them in. Them two go um, together in my eyes because if your line is damaged... Right, it could let you down. I mean, again, I'm going to use this example. Um, I had a tuition yesterday, and he come from a lake, uh, a well-known lake. He did caught two. Right. Anyway, I said, like, um, have you checked your line? How long has it been on it? Two, two years, two years, <laughs> two years. And I thought, Oof. right, here we go. So I walked the line out. I checked the line, mate. There was one point I could snap it like that. How the hell did you get that in? That was the worst rod. But each rod was had damage. So I probably stripped 10 yards off one, 25 off another, 20 off another. So any he, any he, he was using fluorocarbon, so I pre-stretched it all and I said you do the the quarter dance, right? Yeah, with the like the rap sticks. Um, but you wouldn't walk your line out and stretch it and check it. But you do that dance. But if your line ain't right and you hook a carp, what are you going to be? He goes, yeah, I'd be gutted if I lost it. And he says, I can't believe it. I wouldn't. And I said, what What about the hook then? And he, he shoo me his hook on the rig and he'd sharpened it and it was burred over one side. And I said, look, here's a rig. And it was the rod I was bringing here because I set up a, a separate rod. My fifth rod, was it? I don't know. I can't remember. 
<laughs> anyway, it was in a, it was in its own sleeve quiver, and um, and he just goes, I- "I've never ever touched any like a hook so sharp in my life." I said, "Well, what you got to imagine is how many times is a fish like rooting around, sucking and blowing, even my sharpened hooks." So you you know it's a percentages again. Mm. Checking your hook, you know, a hook doesn't cost nothing. Come on, line doesn't cost nothing, does it really? It's not like a brand new rod, but you'd be sitting there with your brand new reels, brand new rods. Oh, I'll have a new buzzers. But my line and my hook, mm. I don't. You don't seem to people worry about that so much. Do you know what I mean? And that's the thing that does the damage, isn't it? Isn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah if you were a hunter, Hassan, and yeah. you had a spear and you were going hunting for something, you'd make sure that was sharp, because if it weren't right, you're going to end up starving, isn't you, mate? Too, right, so I'm a fish hunter. By a hanger. So mate. I want them. Sh- when you watch a carp, and I watched a carp, um, a 38 pound scaly one, pick up a rig in the edge, right? And I'm telling you now, um, yeah, okay, I had a six ounce lead on it, but it proper shit itself. Because it's like. It's done, isn't it? Yeah, it's in. And it's like the pain. The pain is the last part. It's not pain going in, it's pain when it's hooked up. It's, it's had it. It's past the barb, gone. Mm. You said earlier about uh, the bottom of the lake potentially being acidic mm-hmm. and, and corrosion and all those sort of elements if you're leaving rods out for a period of time. In that instance, where you might not be able to sharpen them, do you? St- what do you do? Do you go with your best, the best that you can put out there, or or how do you strike that balance? <sighs> right, there is things you can put on greases, yeah, yeah. you know, nose grease, special ones designed for um when you've sharpened your hooks there's several different makes out there um but i met a person on a, um, a tuition right um and it was at nash lakes royston and one of his workmen come along for, i don't know what the reason was and he, did, he didn't speak very good so you could imagine really deep and all the rest of it and then like and i was doing a hook sharpening thing and he said, do you know what we do? And I, I looked at him, I go, what do you mean? He goes, Jim, he does um, sea fishing for sharks right. and that in Jamaica, wherever it was. Yeah. And he said, we, you imagine you put in that sharpened hook and they use like, it's a big hook, so it's a file, right? Yeah. Okay. And it's in seawater. So, you know, it's going to like corrode fast. So he, what he was doing was just putting a whole garlic clove on it. And I, I just thought, Really? I started doing that, but there was one water where it didn't matter what you'd done. It was okay for a little while. It was that poaching water in Cambridge, right? Mm. And it went really acidic. And there was only one I'm not I'm not going to mention the, the the company because I bought the hooks. Um I wouldn't use them now because I've got what I consider um equally as good, if not a touch better, sharper hooks from Kevin. And uh, that's what I'd have to do because they would act. To be fair, sometimes when it was really bad there, an unsharpened hook point would corrode. An unsharpened hook point? Yeah. It's the only time I've ever done it. And I would actually get up in the night, right? I'd set my alarm for say, so we're in the spring, so like three o'clock, something like that. And recast for bite time. So I knew I had a sharper hook on. Mm. But I've only found that once. Okay. Where, where it's eating hooks unsharpened. But other than that, you sharpen them um, garlic. A garlic clove. Yeah, yeah, if well. it's really bad. Yeah, yeah, I found that's the best. But I haven't found in anywhere like that recently, yeah. to be fair. Okay. You know, like a bloke said, yes, are you going to put anything on that? Like at the wool pack, I go, mate, it's sweet. All the lakes are sweet. Come back shining, you know, no corrosion. Lovely. Love it. That's a great insight, mate, into chod fishing. Um, I definitely need to use chods a bit more, just thinking about that, actually. I tend to use a bit of a yeah, hinge, mate, but I think I need to go I like back. a hinge. Yeah, I We're I'm not going to talk about my hinge this trip, are we? I'm going to have a drink. No, you have a drink of your, your water, mate. Yeah, it's a very expensive <laughs> glass of water, that. Really? Um, we're going to move on to, um, well, actually, before we move on, for you, you talked about a few notable captures 
in terms of chod fishing? You've had loads. Any particular sort of standouts when you look back in, at chod fishing? You talked about your 50 pounders that you've had. Any more? Any more in recent times? Hassan, look, they're <laughs> all special, mate. Even the king of the ugly ones, let's call it like that, they're all special as long as they're real carp. And what I mean by that, um, it's my own start, uh, proper English. Yeah. You know, old ones. They're all, even, yeah, they're all special, mate. You chucking the choddies out over in Europe as well? Not yet. But when you get out there? If I, if I need to, I would, yeah. Go on, the boy. Mm. Mm. Why not? We're going to move on to... Um, what, you, I think, you deem I think as, we've gone over time now. Don't, don't you think so? You I just, see it dark. You're just going to put more... I'm only on going to have four hours over on... A, um, three hours on the church I now. I think you'll find in my experience of fishing charts <laughs> extensively, they only sort of see the movement of the line coming down, so I'm waiting until it's pitch black till you go check them out on the church. So you're using that excuse them. for me. You've given Thank me you. it, mate. I'm just taking... open that up a little bit, because I'm sure nah, that's dark. <laughs> that's really there, dark, boy. <laughs> still light, boy. <laughs> well light out there. Um... Tinted glass, mate, this window. Um, we're going to move on to what you call the dark side rig, and, and I've seen it in various guises from, again, looking at your blog's early days when you used, like, the old Camazon fly hooks. B175, B175, yeah. B175s, through to the modern-day version, which we've actually filmed you tying up, which we'll talk about later. Dark side, when... Do you use the old dark side bottom bait rigs? What makes your decision? Because you talked about before using chods pretty much exclusively regardless of the bottom. So talk me through when the dark side comes into play. When I was chodding, it didn't matter. But now, oh, I might go back chodding. I'll just walk you it's normally, once the leaves drop, I want a pop-up rig. So it's either a choddy or a hinge stiff rig. You know, it just depends. Sometimes I might put two on a hinge, one on a choddy, or two on a choddy, one on a hinge, and just see what happens. That's the way I am. And then you get to a certain part, once it comes into spring, do we ever get a proper spring? We just seem to get summer, don't we? Straight into that, summer, yeah. yeah. And then like that's all gone again, isn't it? But while we're talking about that, it's all cold for a change, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Imagine if it stays like this, we don't get all that rain. We might have an early start. Maybe. Maybe. I can't global see it We're not going down the global warming thing. Anyway, um, look, I I chodded so much, I hadn't put a bottom bait out. So it was just, you know, you're talking with your mates and I'm fishing in the edge on a clay bit. The lead cores out the water. It's that close. And I put a B175 on with a six ounce lead and I've been mugged off with a choddy. You'd seen it? Sort of. Right. I just knew I'd been done. So I then, it might have gone in the end. So I just tied a rig up and I just go, I just, you know, you're talking to your mates on the phone and a bit of therapy and all the rest of it. And I just, oh, I've just gone to the dark side, put a bottom bait rig on. And I was just laying on my on my belly right yeah um, watching the bottom the rod's laying on the floor beside me and I've got a video I'm like handy cam and I used to do all that on YouTube before all of these superstars started doing it I think I'd give that up nine ten years ago doing that didn't I they were good mate you need to bring them back <laughs> now I'll just stick with sipography yeah that's good I mean? oh, that's brilliant to be fair, yeah <laughs> I think Elliot does a better I, I can't edit and all of that I'd rather c- catch him and give him the content anyway um I was like videoing it and all the, and the rod's just gone right next door to me. It's been in and then the next minute I'm just fishing bottom boats. So that's around May time. And it's just like, I've got back in the situation of pop-ups late autumn and then sometime in the spring late now than ever, I seem to go to a bottom bait setup. But, you know, um, again, you know, m- most people use a standard hook link is nine to 10 inch if you're lucky in it yeah yeah maybe even sure. i like to be yeah i like to be different so it's always 12 14 in the end i was using 16 18 inch rigs on a on a, on a lead clip not mm. running shouldn't even talk about running leads because I'm, I'm on about doing that as well who uses a running lead now mm. jim shelley <laughs> it's been a long time since i've done that so 
um, you just mess around and it's like the normal coated hook link and then you strip a bit back and then I use a certain liner liner and um, I've given, I give one to Alan Blair and I said, can you please source? He hasn't come back yet, but um, that'd be mega if you could find him because I'm on about my last 40 or 50 and they've got to um, last the, uh, the rest of my carp fishing unless I can find something in there. And there is nothing else I've found yet that is as good as what I use. Why is that? Um, the bulk end where the, the, um, the eye of the hook goes in is quite robust and stiff. And then it shoots out like a curved bit that is quite, it's not stiff. It's like soft, a lot softer. So it bends more. So it works against the carp not for the carp so it bends around the mouth and i've just found them to i've tried loads of different ones and they just seem to be the best by far so you've got up to long hook links big leads of course five six ounce love them you know it's got to be done um even in the silt you know i just put a bag on a mesh bag normally yeah um can't faff around with a normal bag PVA bag takes too long. Um, so I'd, I'd prefer to use that. It, it stops tangles and slows uh, the descent of the lead to the bottom and gives you presentation. Um, then I messed, look, it's like, again, you try things. I was happy with that for quite a few years. And then, oh, what did I do? I think Jane chucked me out the downstairs toilet, what was my fishing room. And there was an old spool of trigger link there. So anyway, I've like clocked it, but I didn't, I, I put it in a shed we'd bought, but highlighted it. So I'd all, when I went in there, I'd always look at it. Mm-hmm. Right. So this was done in the winter, so I wouldn't be using a bottom bait, right? Yeah. So anyway, I've gone in there and um, this is... God, I'm gonna, I'm gonna have more crap now, and I, because I'm gonna admit I was fishing in COVID. Um, anyway, we'll cut that bit. <laughs> oh, I don't care anyway. <laughs> fishing is my job. Um, what did Boris say? If you can't yeah, work yeah, from yeah. home, you can go to work. Yeah, yeah, right. So can't catch a fish out the front of my house. Um, and then I, I, I went to work in Cambridge. So anyway, I was sure I was getting mugged off a bit, but. This was in March and I was messing around with a bottom bait, but over clean stuff. And I could yeah. see these carp. Right? I've got some awesome footage on my phone of this carp. Say, so I'd have left. It could have been a Wednesday or Thursday. So Wednesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. And I was back Sunday, right? Um, And I'd... I'd, I'd messed around with this stuff and I, I could never get it to work for me. Um, like the length, the colour of it is a, it is what it is, but there is ways around it by dyeing it with clay and the best thing is um, cling on putty. It dyes it and weights it, which we've done a video about how, because it is quite technical how you set it up and get it right, which will be, it'll take a lot of, stress out of my answering questions on Instagram about it because I can just go, go and watch that. So yeah. Dan Yeoman's done some good f- uh, filming for me on that one. So throughout this, and this is a, you said there, it takes some effort and some precision to set them up. Same with the chod rig, mm. same with the sharpening. And what we've done, and you'll see throughout watching this podcast is we've basically like Jim's hinted to Dan's filmed it. We're going to, but you said pictures and I went, Let's video. You it. did. It was your idea. Yeah. yeah I Let's pictures. film it. And then I, cause you, you know, you can't see it. You can't, a picture doesn't show the whole story. Does it? No, it doesn't show the process. Does yeah. It, I it's a story in it. How, what you're doing. So like, that's why while I waited for you, I thought I'd. Go, I'm not that. It's a great depth. idea from you, Jim. Um, you, you media, you, you lost on the bank, mate. You should be a media, <laughs> shouldn't you? You've done it. Um. Anyway. Right. So, I've got this stuff. It's looked at me and I picked it up and I've set up a lead clip on lead core. And I thought I want a big lead because I need it bungee fied 
I need a weight to pull as it does any testing or anything like that. I need the lead not to move. And so I went for a six ounce flattened Nash lead and an inline or on a lead clip job. Lead clip. Yeah, I said lead okay. clip on lead core, right? And it was the length to get right. So anyway, I spent the afternoon messing around with different lengths because you, you've got to wet it first before it goes bungee fired, then it shrinks. Anyway, I got to the point of like the lead's there on my hand there and I've got this one and I'm pulling. Say it's that far away and it's like, no, that's not right. It's not doing what I want it to do. Anyway, I found this is dry, okay? No more than 10 inch and no shorter than 8 inch. I like 8 inch. Eight and a half inch, round that dry, dry. So that's yeah. without wetting. Yeah. The so because as I got Kevin's number, I rung him up. Right now, I text him first just to say I didn't want to disturb him. It was a weekend, so I text Kevin on a weekend. Can I speak to you? Anyway, I said, look, I just want to talk to you about this, and he went, yeah, yeah, just, just. And I spoke to him about it, and he said, Jim, you're basically right there. What you've done, I just wanted to know from the man himself because. You know, how long has this material been going? 18, 19? Yeah, 17? a long time that's been developed. And it's it's not used. So he then told me about um, claying it and all the rest of it, or rubbing putty. Now, I've, the video shows you how much pain you have to get to get that putty right and certain tweaks with the hook link to set it and then break it to it for it to bungee after a coat of putty. So I'm armed with a rig. Um, it's totally, you know, I've used it, a bungee rig, a long time ago with a red power gum. And I'm talking 30-odd yeah. years ago with pound Acron, right? So I'm going back to, Christ, if I've been cut, cut like 40, 38, 40 years ago, I was doing that, right? Yeah, 38 years ago. Jesus. Um that's a bit mad thinking about that. Um, I sold her the me, mate, and you said I was 40. Let's <laughs> <laughs> not go down there. Anyway, um, I've got everything how I want it. I'm happy with the end result. Bungified, it's not a white colour or pale colour. It's now very dark, black, weighted. I'm, I'm mega happy with it. Not one rod. All rods are on it. That's how much I like the look of it. Because I've still got my normal liner liner set up, right? Okay, so you've so, got... Whoa, whoa, whoa. Let's, <laughs> I'm going to overlay the footage, but how is that... So how is the how is that incorporated and how is the hook section different? Like what a lot of people will say is, God, that's expensive. Like, like it's a combi rig, but time-consuming, tying two bits of hook linked together. Yeah. But what I do is... The hardest part is you'll see in the video is setting it up. That boom is, it's a boom, right? Can stay on that rig. The longest I've left it is four months. Yeah. And normally what happens is I cut the swivel when I cut the hook link off and I'm using a, a Nash micro swivel. Okay. So that's eight inch dry, right? The hook link part. Okay. When it's tied on, I like inch and three quarters, no more than two. I've found I'm not saying it's no good, but that, that's personally from my messing around trials, right? Fishing with them, different lengths and that. Inch and three quarters, and no the, more than two inch. And that is from, that's the the hook link. Okay. Right. So, from the so swivel... that's 20 pounds yeah. um, skin link. Right. And I use the black one, like silky colour, right? Um, you tie that on. So all you've got to do, you've got the same boom, you're using less... The coated hook link, and it's still not stripped, so it's really it's robust, stiff, lot of movement. So it's not stripped to your hook there. No your skin link. No, and the hair, the hair is long as well. So if I had a hair right, and I'm not talking about from the, it's from the ring, so that's on the curve of the hook, yeah. and it would be that long. And I mean, last year I caught fifty pounder, and there was two six millers on there. Because I'd put where my hair stop would be, yeah. Um, the knot, I'd make the knot a lot bigger, half the length, and fix it on there. Right. So, 
What's the rationale behind that? They don't see it. It's different. It's just been different, isn't yeah. it? I want them to pick it up, be happy with it, chuck it in the mouth. Um, you put a bit of putty on the micro swivel for weight. You put a bit of putty halfway still down the hook link because you don't know, even though you think that's clean, you don't know what that might be laying over. So it enhanced like the pin down effect. Um, and uh, I mean, I had a 3812 common the session before the 50 last year. Um, and this is like uh, end of October. And you'd get your Brady main line. It was bleak. Right, so it wouldn't be a slack line. It'd be a back lead on that. I was only fishing about 20, 25 yards out. A heavy back lead dropped down and I'd fished a bob, like bobbin tight. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, so it's, not, it's a small drop. That bleep, right, why would it bleep? Okay, it could be a liner. And like, I remember the wind was blowing at me. Yeah, it was then. It was a Norvly. It was the week before the wolf moon. And it was blowing at me and it was cold. Anyway, I I thought, why would that do that? Start to unthink. You watch the old blue light go out on the R3, zipped it back down, and then it bleep bleep. Chess waders on because it's a chess way to swim. Went out there, and as I got to the rod, it pulled up tight, and that'd been on there, I reckon, um, 25 to 30 seconds, or that actually had enough. Of, yeah, it couldn't get rid of that hook. And you've got to imagine when you set the, the big lead up, once he's gone to the point of really shook it, it's done. gone. Yeah, it's gone. Yeah. I want the lead off as yeah. fast as possible. So, um, I've messed around with another way of doing it. Oh God, Kev's going to kill me here. Look, I used to use another lead clip, right? But I've now bought their lead clip and I'm not using, I don't, it's got a thing you put through it, right? And, but when you pull, I think it's a size eight swivel in, but Nash do a double, it's got a double ring on it. Yeah, yeah, double ring. I cut one of them off. Okay. Right, and I pull that in, and it's semi-fixed. But as soon as they pull against it, that's moving, and then is you get that point of reference. If they're doing anything before the lead's gone, they can't use it anymore. It's yeah, finished. No yeah, I've started doing that. That's recent, though. So that's a progression, even on that. Yeah, bungee, keep changing isn't it? it all the time. Yeah, but that bungee, in terms of t- so there, you've talked about that 38 pounder before you caught your 50. You talked about the one bleep, it being on, not being able to deal with this bungee element because the hook's pulling in, isn't it, all the yeah, time yeah. because of the bungee. And you get in... They're testing us all more than you can ever imagine. What about resetting them? Because that the, 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 the sort of trigger link is quite supple. When it's taken on water, I know it's heavy and you've weighted it with the the Klingon stuff. If you are being done on that, and I'm, I'm not saying you're being done all the time yeah. because there is... Do you ever worry about that element in your bottom bait rigs? About it not being ready for the next fish? All this resetting moved? thing. Go on. Only if it was really dirty. I was fishing on clay. Yeah. Right. So, all right. There could have been a twig there or whatever. That's something you would never know. Yeah. You know, I, I, I wouldn't know that unless I put a camera. I'm not going into all of that, doing that sort of stuff. It's all past me. Um, I look at it like this. You can get done all the time, just not by carp. So you might get done by a carp, but a roach might come along and do the shake, move it and set it up for you again. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? The more, the thing I'm more worried about is the bottom's clean. The bottom's soft and clean. The bottom's hard and clean. Right. And it'd either be a six ounce lead on the harder stuff, right? So if I got like a firm drop, that's still all right. I like that. But a soft drop, then I would go to a, a five ounce distance shape lead in the silt more. Okay. But I'm more worried about the rig through the air. So what I do is because it's like you, you said it's bungee fied. Um, it can go anywhere. I can't risk tangles because it would tangle is I put a bag on. Yeah. It's just a standard bag, uh, a mesh bag, crumb, five boilies, lay the, the, the long hair along it, um, 
and then so the hair can't tangle around the hook, I then tape the bait. Tape around the bag and the hook. Yeah. Yeah. So you've got the same scenario. You just with that though, you I did show it in the video. You've got to PVA the lead clip was your with the force of the lead, come off. but the bag it'll come off. Yeah. Okay. So that's a thing you need to do straight away. So straight away, for instance, you've got the rig all tied up. You're ready to go. Okay. Um, let's say you've had a fish. You're sorting it out. You go back to it. Okay. So you um, you dry the lead clip because you've got to PVA that up at some point and you know there's water in it. So you dry that up, you then wet the trigger link straight away. That's important. And I'm, I do it twice through the, the, you know, like the setting up of the rig. Um, once that's all done, you then put your, you put your bag on, uh, your baits are on, your bag's on, and you cast it out there. That's the only thing I need to know is in flight, that that isn't tangling, mm. even though I know it doesn't, right? I watch every rig through through on the skyline, okay? Um, different at night, you can use the moon sometimes, but if not, I make sure it's on a clip. So as soon as it hits a clip, it just goes round, okay? Um, and then what I want that to do, because I'm using big leads, I need it to the bag to slow the descent of the lead to the bottom. So it's cushioning it a bit more instead of just going straight down. Do you know what I mean? And uh, that gives me presentation on the part I'm more worried about. Because if you can imagine eight inches of that hook link yeah. is like jelly. So if even if it went in silt or laid, say the hook link went, the lead was one side of a branch, a twig on the bottom that stuck up and the hook link could go over it. I still had presentation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, because it's so jellyfied, bungee yeah, 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 supple. Um, and then all I'm worried about is my end bit presented on the bottom. Either the bag lands on top of the hook bait or it, um, or underneath yeah, it. Yeah. That's all I'm worried about. Anything else, mate, that's out of my control. So you're happy, 100% confident with that. As long as it's gone through the air, you're happy. Yeah. One thing that, and you said... But the best thing about a chod is you can chuck it anywhere. In this instance, and I'm thinking about a scenario where you rock onto a lake, you found them, and it is your, your sort of weedy, typical gravel pit, let's say. With this, I'm guessing you've at least got to chuck a lead out there to feel where the drop is in that area. Would you, and you said you categorised it by saying, I've got autumn that time of year where I look at sort of pop-ups and getting the hook off the bottom because of all the leaf litter and stuff. Mm. You look at the time of year for fishing bottom baits. If you found them and it is bottom bait time of year and it is a weedy water, do you think you, do you go in, use a leading rod, find a spot where you can present that or do you go straight in with a chod? What, what, where's your thinking in that? It's so many scenarios. Yeah, it's deep. I know. Sorry. I don't even... Well, for seven years, I only chucked a chuddy out so I can get out of that one, can't I? Yeah. In that seven-year period. Um, right. If I didn't... Look, I think the best thing to say is I've gone to a lake and I don't know if it's weedy yeah. or whatever, yeah? Yeah. So what I would do, let's say I found them... If I was chodding, I'd just cast the chod out. But let's say I was more into um, fishing a bungee dark side rig... I would put a light lead on, as small as lead as possible, and cast it as far as possible, right, and reel it back. And that would tell me all I need to know. Just one cast? Yeah, mate. Yeah. Yeah. If I had to, three, but I don't really worry about things like that. Do you, you know? No, nah, because if it's going to be weed, it's going to be weed. But look, seven years, up until seven years ago, or whatever it was, I would have just chucked a choddy out. Yeah. It, it, but you a scenario that, now, but I'm going into that scenario again. Yeah, but that's what you see for me. And, and, and you know, a bag is if there's, you know, like for instance, if it's in the spring and there's like a little bit of choddy laying around, a bit of silkweed growing, you know, a bottom bait with a bag is fine. Yeah, it's fine. They're, they're rooting in it. But once you get structural stuff, yeah, that becomes a different ball game because you've got a, 
rely on that's even if you keep presentation you won't yeah well, you, you're not going to know are you no I don't want to be in that scenario so straight on with the child if, if I look if I went to a lake and I couldn't find out on the internet and it's quite easy these days to find out the makeup of a lake um, in the four call it four seasons right yeah um, I would go down there and I would cast a lid around. Yeah. That's what I would do before I even attempted it. So I've, I've actually looked at the lake um, because you don't know when you go, you might find them, might you? It's the noise factory again, you know, if, look, if I turned up and found them fizzing, if I was in doubt, I'd chuck a chod out. Yeah. That's as simple as that and go from there. Because if you catch one, scare them or don't catch one and scare them or they just scare, go, you can then investigate that area, can't you? Yeah, totally. I think it's a starting just, point. That's a great starting point. Do you see it? what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But if you know the lake's clean and clear, then you can just chuck yeah. a, bat, a bottom bait out with a bag, can't you? Do you think that as a... As a as a presentation, will catch you fish that the choddy won't catch you, and vice versa. Do you think there are fish that? that yeah, but are... don't you think? Look, what's the going fad at the moment? It's gone on far too long now. Ronnie fishing. Yeah, Ronnie rigs. Yeah, right. It's it's like me. Look, right. Hassan likes a fillet steak. I do. Right with a whatever way I'm going to catch you. I catch you, I catch you, I catch you, I catch you. And what happens? You become very wise, don't you? I'm not in a fillet steak. Because you are picking up the same old, same old all the time. So it's what I say to people, the only way forwards is backwards. Look, for instance, look, no disrespect. When I went to Conningbrook for the very first time, I knew from people that they were using the same sort of small hook, light mono scenario with uh, some bread bag and whatever in it. And I'm not having a go. It's just the same old from what Lee Jackson caught yeah. two-toner. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's not, it's just, and I thought, right, they don't feed them here. So I've got something different. I've got seeds of the gods, salt as well. Um, I'm going to fish a boily. I'm going to fish a small but sharp hook, but I'm going to fish a big inline running lead. And as I walked round there, I saw all I needed to see because the rigs were hanging in the butt rings. I walked round there and I walked straight into a swim and a carp showed and I thought that'll do me. Two days later, I was doing my own thing over 40 kilos of salty seeds Chocolate. and they walked round to me and go, Jim, they don't have bait in here. <laughs> right. And, oh, Sometimes you have to listen to yourself, did not you? Yeah, yeah, definitely. You see what I'm saying? If everyone's doing the same, right, it's normally, when someone turns onto a lake and does it, they're doing something different, isn't they? Yeah. you just got to find out what it is, and it's being different. At the moment, do you know what? Look, I just had a walk around a church lake, and I'm going up there with Henry, right, He's like off his head because he's going to be fishing with me. Uh, we've had a bit of banter. I said, you can't pole out. You can't do this, right? You can't that's made blah, his, blah, 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 blah. That's made his life, Jimbo. He's gonna, you're going to have the whole night with him, mate. Okay, Kev said, sleep. I could have the lake to myself, right? But I said, no, nah, come up here as well. Be a laugh. We'll have a few drinks. Get an Indian delivered. I've got to be gone by 11 because thank you, Jane, for letting me actually yeah, stay here you, tonight. Yeah, thank you, Jane. And helping um, Hassan. Out, yeah, thank you, Jane. Massively, I should have said that before. <laughs> I'll send. I'll give you some. I'll and send I you said some more Clorox. <laughs> I said, look, I'm going to chod, but I'm going to use right a paste bait, right? But I'm going to, you know, like if you make, I don't know if you've ever made your own. You get a cork ball and you mould mm. a bit of paste around it, and then you boil it. You add a hook bait hardener to it. I'm not going to do that, right? I'm going to mould the paste round, um, a court, 13 mil cork ball, no more, no less, the same amount. I'm going to get a pair of my ladies tights, right? And I'm going to put it in there, twist it tight. Okay. So it starts to squeeze for all them tiny little holes. I then get some dental floss. Okay. I then make a slip knot, pull it tight. I then cut it off and then blob it. And then I roll it in my hand 
right? Hard. Okay. And then what happens is that lady's tights disappear. And for all them 100, 200 holes, pace comes out. Mm. And I'm going to cast them out tonight. And I've got about a kilo block of paste. And I'm going to fire paste out to be different because I've had enough of, you know, high vis attract single look bait fishing and that doesn't seem to be happening and i've been talking to a lot of people and the same thing got to go a different route yeah if it's not I mean? working yeah experiment mm. you're not losing anything because you're not catching because i've it. only got look look, look i could get the, i could get the pole out and do that and put bottom baits out and be quiet i can't i need to put a big lead out with that bungee dark side rig um I want to be discreet because you've uh, I've only got a night, yeah. So I'm going to fish it chod style and then just f- a few bits. Right. I might win, it might not, but that's what I'm thinking about doing the whole of this winter. Mm. But I don't want to scare them because with the chod, it'll only be an ounce lead on there. You with me? Yeah. But I did say to Henry, look, Hassan, yeah, he's like it's a nightmare. Done him a favour. He's um. You know, this is going to go into dark, but maybe we'll go up there and just walk around in the dark, see if they top. And I was happened to pick the, the end where the last two fish come out of. So sweet, isn't it? Wish me luck. We'll see what happens there. Them, but mate. it's about being different. You know, a pace bait, think about it. If, if it's been laying a bait land, lays there for a while, it washes out. Um, but it's go soft, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, I've done it with loads of things like that meshing up. Oh, it's, it's, you know, caught loads of carp, loads of carp doing it. Bungie, talk to me about your significant captures on that. Oh, Jesus Christ. That's pretty, how, how recent have you been using that? I'm on my second year. Second year, I was going to say, yeah. it's pretty recent, isn't it? Yeah. Um, first carp after putting the rig in was a 40 pound, it might have been 40 pound two, it might have been 40 pound for a linear. And the rig had only been in position 26 minutes. Uh, and I, I was stunned how quick it went. And and it was one that hadn't been out for ages. Uh, um, another one, Rosie. Rosie yeah. uh, pulled out as well. The only time I've really pulled out on Lake 5-6. Found them, dropped it in there. Seven holes, the seven holes. yeah. Yeah. Um, and the by on the bun three minutes wow I suppose three minutes big lead again six ounce 24 minute battle on a one a very elusive fully scaled 41 which I've been chasing on and off for about 11 years um mate it's, it's 50 pound mirror lasts I think it was November, on the wolf moon end of October you know it's what else did I? I had a forty-five mirror out of Lake um, Eight. That that was last August on a bungee. That still hasn't been out. So that's what a year. Yeah, a year and a year. Bit, yeah, yeah. A year and a half, man. Getting on that. So one. that's a wise one. Hasn't been out a lot, and it hasn't been out for over a year now. For all of that pressure, but I managed to catch it on that, and I had forty carp out of that swimming around six weeks. It's definitely, you know, it's definitely being different. It's, it's an edge, but you've got to get it right. And hopefully with the film, it will help people understand how to actually set it up correctly. Yeah. Kev's always said to me, we, I think we talked about when I first came, he said like, we went through sort of products and what sells, if you like. Mm. He's always said like, Trigger has been the best edge that nobody's really got onto mm-hmm. with any sort of gusto. It's definitely not one of the biggest sellers in the range by any means, yeah. but he says use correctly. It is a massive, massive I like edge. it in 30. Do you? Yeah. I, I like it in 30. I just like to know it's, I just, I think it, it's, it goes more like puffy, more bungee fight. Yeah. I, I definitely like the 30. Yeah. hundred percent more. Yeah. 30 for me. Definitely worth something having a go at, I think. See, as you say, it's different, mate, and it's working from that other angle as well. I've, I've had Steve Renyard come in, talk about hermit rigs and that bungee fine element before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You've talked about it in the past, but this is sort of, it's encapsulated in that hook length. As long as you activate it, as you say, and wet it. But you've got a 30-pound hook link on yeah, you. Yeah, it's, it's... You know, you don't have races. to use 30-pound. 
did they do it in 25, yeah, 20? Yeah, 25 and a 20. Yeah, yeah. So, but I like the 30. I've never had it go on me or nothing. No. I've used it in snags, weed, lily pads. I bought trees. Well, I had one from Belgium, a 30, 33, 12 common. And I, well, if I hadn't had braid on, I wouldn't have even managed to get it in. Yeah. Right. And when I pulled it off, no, no problem. No Hook problem. wise. What hook have you got? You said you've got your skin link. It's, yeah, it's the same thing. It's a claw. I've caught them on sixes. Yeah. I like it. There was a particular carp, one of two I was chasing out of Lake Seven this year at the Wallpack. Um, a scaly one normally goes about £41, pound, but um, I caught it the wrong way at 38 and I didn't weigh it the second time. And it comes out, if you're lucky, once you had it twice in, twice in 10 days on a bungee. <laughs> I caught it on a size five out in the lake and I caught it two weeks later. Well, in Ollie style, half a, no, quarter of a wrap out. Yeah. That's the one I saw pick it up and that was on a size six. But I like the five. It's just personal preference. I just think bigger gape. I'm not worried about the the size of the hook ratio to the size of the bait. bait. Yeah. No, not at all. No. No, no, no. I like a big hook with a small baits on. 100%. Mm. For you, with with that rig, moving it forwards, and we talked about another element with the lead, in terms of the, the indication and the setup with your rods, is it the same rods in the air? Is the drop the same on the bobbin? Is it still slack? Is it not? Talk to me. See how you've done me here. Yes. Look, <laughs> I bought some new reels, right? So I'm a tackle tart. Yeah, I bought them. And I've been using these reels like Nash Pursuits for 18, 20 years since they come out. But the company's so tight, it won't give me any reels. But there you go. Who cares anyway? Not <laughs> mine. So <laughs> um, maybe it's because I've got four. Um, I don't know. Anyway. Five, haven't you? <laughs> no, that's on the best old one, <laughs> which I've had serviced. Right. Anyway, um, I've started using rear rod rests. Because, yeah. you know, if it rains, you get splashed back, don't you? On your rods, you don't want that. No, do on the reels. On your reels. Yeah, so, so I've started, but I do have the tips up. But sometimes I have the tips. It's like, you know, you put a picture up of your rods out, like on Insta, right, on one of your stories, and people are commenting, it's like, why are your rod tips low, Jim? Why have you got a, a, a rear rod wrist? <laughs> I didn't think people watch like that, but I suppose, you know, I did look back on some of my um, stories and I'm not joking you, right? They average between four and 6,000 views per thing. It's like... You're an influencer, mate. Like it or not. I said this at the start, mate. You're an influencer, (laughs) mate. I'm not. I'm a therapist. I'm a therapist. (laughs) But look, come on. You you know me. You not not quite know what you're going to see, are you? Because all of a sudden you can see something about Boris, or it's like very close to the market getting like your account shut down. But you know, and uh, yeah, you, you know, and then oh yeah, there's a bit of information about how to go carp fishing. Look at him; he's live. He's in a restaurant. He's half drunk. He's out with his mates. He's he's the same as all of us, really, isn't he? He's not no different. It's definitely one of the best stories. He's mate. just a miserable, a miserable get on the bank. You don't know what you're going to get. I love it, mate. It's one of the best stories. The highlight, mate. When, it, when I see it flash up, I'm there straight away. What's he got on there? A seagull? <laughs> Some little I was, like, I was in Belgium, weren't I? And I was like, Elliot weren't there. So I go, all right, Elliot, are you sheeping me out, right? And tell your mates to F off like that. And the, the sheep looked round. It was like perfect. You couldn't, uh, you know, that sheep. He was, oh, mate. It was just like bang on, you know. <laughs> but it's part of it, isn't it? It's yeah. Got to yeah. have a laugh, isn't you? Or have I got it wrong? No, you've got to have a laugh, a hundred percent. Life's too short, mate, isn't it? Yeah. Well, that's the way I look at it. Some yeah. of the stories I put up, are, it's ones I get, and you put them up, like TikTok stuff. Like a mate sends me some stuff, and I can't put that up. I really can't, but I want to. Do you know what I mean? I can't do that. It's like too to the too close, you know, for yeah. a lot of reasons, you know. So you yeah. have to think about it before you press the button. Years ago, I wouldn't have. It You're calming be, down, isn't you? It would just be, um, can I swear? Yeah, of course you can. Fuck it. Yeah. <laughs> That's all I would say. But I try not to now, you know. But if someone pushes my button, I like to have a little pushback, you know. It's good, <laughs> isn't it? 
<laughs> yeah, I pretty... should know better because I'm a professional, an ambassador. You're a consummate. You were here earlier than me today. <laughs> You're a consummate professional, Jim, mate. <laughs> yeah, you're 150 mile away while I was four minutes down the road. And I'm eight minutes away. <laughs> Lift Jim. that up there now. Lift that it's up there now. It's not dark yet, mate. Look. It's pitch. Oh. That is not dark, Jim, mate. <laughs> it's black. That's not, these are tinted windows. Are you going to help me? Okay. Um, I'll help you get Push my barra up there, yeah? Push your barra. I think the quad takes you around now, mate. Do you want the noise of the quad? That's what you want, going at the back of I the I said swim. to Henry, can I get my power barra on the back of the quad? I'm not. He hasn't answered that question yet. Well, we'll so I've only got to go so far, and then yeah, you can make half the noise and then go yeah. stealth yeah. Mode with your. Pace oh, we walk, started walking up there, and like there's shells and a certain on the path in there. <laughs> Stop walking on the on the shells. Oh, we, we should have filmed this little night session with him. You're gonna have an absolute <laughs> ball with him. Mate. I walk past the cops, and I go, a cops top there because there was a load, unless it was a bird. And he goes, oh, Alan, I think, feeds him there. And then I go, look, this bowl. And Henry's going, he's on it, he's on it like this. And then he's going, um, all right, I'll, I'll fish that part of the lake. You fish that part of the lake. I'm going, you're not using a pole. And he's got, he's off his head, mate. Oh, and I said, look, brilliant, let's that, just mate. put a pole up there and ask everyone on Instagram, can Henry use his pole or not? And he was absolutely shitting himself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it'll be quality, mate. You'll have a great time, mate. You'll have a laugh. It'll be worth that. And I think you've got a chance. It ain't Baltic tonight. Well, no, we had um, like mega cold yesterday, didn't we? Yeah, mega cold. And uh, air pressure was through the roof. And mm. I looked before you turned up and it was 9.98. Night. So from to go all that way to that way, it's cloudy now. There's a chance. Who knows? It's cartfish. If you ain't got a rig out there, well, you're not going to catch one, are you? No, too right. Jim, it's been a fascinating talk through loads of stuff, rig-based. It's definitely made me think. I've hoped, well, I'm sure it's helped a lot of people out there as your video idea, as in terms of time, things and components. We'll definitely have you back in. Um, Thank you for listening and watching. Make sure you subscribe and leave us a review. Jim, good luck on the church. I'll see you soon, mate. Thank Thank you for coming in. Um, Thanks for listening. Hope you enjoy it. Hope hope you get some knowledge from it. Have a great Christmas and all the best for the new year. Nice one. As Jim would say, that's a cut. (laughs) Cut, cut. (laughs) 